Charlotte Raven, you're a feminist writer and a journalist, and your writings have shown scant sort of sympathy for the plight of men as, uh, as put up there. Do you think that there is an argument for the same form of programme for men as we had 30 years ago for women? Um, well, first of all, I think um, that I'd be interested to know exactly what this programme is, because as far as I could tell from the proposals put forward on the film, um, you're talking about very small piecemeal kinds of solutions, but I think actually what many of the men who are complaining about this situation are talking about is um, turning the clock back. You know, what men are finding now is that they are feeling that they are victims of um, a situation which actually represents their loss of power. Now, what they are finding difficult to adjust to is the fact that they no longer hold the positions that they used to in society um, and are finding themselves unable to cope with that. The only way, presumably, of addressing that is turning the clock back, clawing back the advances um, that we've made through feminism over the last 20 years um, and getting our humanity back to a situation um, which surely nobody would want. But, but in saying that, do you take the problems that were outlined in the film in any way seriously? They, do they not add up to you to something other than just a loss of power, but a, a really significant problem for and with men? I think that when men are complaining, um, actually what they're complaining about um, is the fact that they don't want to change. Um, you know, the world has changed. Um, they, they could change with it, but what they're complaining about is that they don't want to find ways of adjusting. And more than that, they don't want to give up their power. Um, and who can blame them? You know, now it's obviously the case that um, things are going badly for young boys at this moment. Um, but this, after all, is a transitional phase. You know, I would like somebody to come up with an argument about what you can do to help those boys, other than giving them homework lessons, you know, which nobody would object to, without um, jeopardising the things that I've been talking about, about feminism. So you don't, uh, but, but, but first we have to kind of decide whether or not there's an urgency to it. Um, and the education statistics, just take the education statistics, the um, trend has been so quick for girls to overtake boys are so dramatic over such a short period of time. As far as we know, that trend's not finished yet. It's, sort of, it's got quite a long way to go. Um, and an awful lot of people say, well, this is because boys don't have um, the necessary skills and they ha we're not giving them the necessary skills. And the very least one could do is say, should there be in place a really kind of significant effort, as we made with girls in engineering and science and mathematics, to correct that? Now, would you say, well, that's well, just Well, there are two things about that. I mean, the first thing is that I think... Um, when girls were being disadvantaged at, at school and when, you know, people were talking about sexism direct against women, you know, that was, they were oppressed as a gender, you know, and that a lot of that oppression was to do with the way that men were responding to them. Girls were helped out in that sense. But there is also um, the issue that when, for example, in schools, Asians started overtaking whites because as a result of having been disadvantaged for a period of time, they, they worked harder and then over, uh, surmounted um, the people that they were, um, the, the, the whites in their class. You know, we didn't say, well, therefore the whites should be helped out to get back on top. You know, I think what we're going to find is there'll be a short period of time um, where the balance is, is reversed, but, you know, it will be addressed itself. No, but we did, say, we did say it about young Afro-Caribbeans. We did say that there was a, a specific problem for them, which we thought might be a problem of prejudice, or it might, you know, it might have all kinds... But the point was, having noticed it, we decided we should do it something about it. isn't a problem of prejudice in schools. You know, what it's a problem of is um, boys needing to adjust to a different culture where they're not on top. You know, which is not to say that that's impossible, but saying that what they've got to do is try and get back on top again is not to address the underlying problem. Um, you know, and also I think there is an element in which the whole idea that feminism has won is, is completely overstated. Um, I think the myth of female liberation has got a lot to do with the idea that we suddenly started saying at a certain point, actually men can behave like how they like. You know, they don't have to change. And feminism, I think, is partly responsible for what's happened here because after, you know, putting forward arguments why male behaviour had to alter in, for, for the greater good of everybody, we then suddenly decided um, that that didn't matter anymore and men could carry on behaving as they wanted to. And as long as that's the case, then there's no impetus for, any, for, for anybody to change. Well, um, a, a, a different, a, a, another way of looking at that argument would be to say it's not so much that you gave up on it, it's just that once you'd, uh, once you'd uh, got a significant way down the path towards women's liberation, we discovered that we didn't know what men were for. 
That's how the argument goes there, that you, didn't, that, you no. didn't provide them with anything else. <laughs> People to, to do think know about what men doing. are for, um, but it's, if, if women are finding that they don't need men in their personal lives, that they're finding it difficult in pro their professional lives to get on with men, then that is because men are failing to understand what it is. Um, how they can respond to the modern world. Um, you know, they are completely the victims of their own um, refusal to adapt. I but think. going back to school, how can a seven-year-old boy or a ten-year-old boy be the, be, the, be the victim of his own refusal? He, he comes to the world and he looks at the world and sees the sort of role models on offer and he sees what is said about, uh, said about men and boys and he looks at that and he thinks, well, but I, don't, I can I, be but I think it's a, myth. a male stripper or a footballer. I think it's a myth. The idea that, that we have this huge weight of cultural evidence which is running men down. Um, you know, you mentioned some of those adverts. You know, what those adverts are doing is simply redressing the balance. And actually, if you look at most of the cultural evidence, it's completely in the other direction. Um, you know, the, the rise of men's magazines, you know, the kind of Claudia Schiffer walking down the stairs taking her clothes off, you know, these things which we wouldn't have seen 20 years ago, you know, or at least there would have been an outcry to them. Um, you know, certainly the cultural evidence is, is very much in favour of the male, you know, that it's saying this is a version of masculinity, you can still, you can still read pornography, you can still go around objectifying women, um, and nobody's going to do anything about that. Um, and in fact, you know, there's nothing that you need to do to address it. Uh, but uh, but the, uh, I mean, what some people might say is that there's a general sexualisation of, of society and that actually this is redressed by the fact that we now have many more sexualised images of young men than we used to. But specifically, you're allowed to do things in the culture, say things and do things about men that you couldn't conceivably say and do about women. Well, what? like chucking them out of a place glass window <laughs> if they take the, take the girlfriend's motor, like I said. Well, a lot of these things are very tongue-in-cheek, I think, and I'm not sure that there's how, how much you, you can read from them. Um, but I think, you know, in general, you, you have to talk about the broad sweep, and the broad sweep is, is that the crisis of masculinity is a trumped-up thing, you know, made up largely by men who think that in proclaiming themselves as losers, they can absolve well, themselves from responsibility for changing. Well, Charlotte, let's, let's take the concrete example of the, uh, of the workplace and apply, and apply that notion to it. A lot of men have lost jobs because the industries that they used to work in have gone. Um, the new sorts of jobs which are available are not jobs that they find themselves particularly good at. So are we saying that men are incapable of the, the, the skills that the new um, jobs require, which is interpersonal skills, communication skills? Now, this We're is saying that part, they don't you know, have them at the moment. Yes, OK, and so what we have is a lag, but of, of necessity they will adapt to that or they will be left behind. There is nothing that needs to be instituted specifically in order to make this process more but simple for but, them. But that sounds at one level almost perverse. It sounds almost perverse. I mean, firstly, in the lag, and an awful lot of problems can be caused, and secondly, um, uh, because, because of so criminality what are you talking, and so you're, on. You're talking about and secondly, if, if it were reversed, you'd do things, wouldn't you? You'd, you'd so, yeah, yeah, courses. but you're talking about training them for, um, to, to have interpersonal skills and to be good communicators. You know, but actually what's happening is that many of the men who talk about the crisis of masculinity say, well, we don't know how to be. You know, we don't know how to change, how to change in this world. We don't know what women it want us to do. Now, this is complete myth. You know, they need only look over their shoulder and there's a woman walking right behind them. You know, it is very obvious. It's their actually. problem. Yeah, no, it's, 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 it's untrue that they don't see the way forward. It's that they've decided not to mm. take it. So do you accept uh, that, say, in, uh, taking the family as a kind of last example, that um, although a lot of the redressing has been necessary, we've now left a lot of men now victims in families too? I don't think they're victims. I think um, that women are finding that they, in, you know, they, that there's a lot of instances that are thrown up, you know, particularly the Jodie Foster kind of cases of... Um, and the idea that women are able and, and want now to embark on family life without men. Um, but this again is the case, you know, instead of trying to tell the women that they, they shouldn't be doing that or to tell us that we should be going back to an old version of masculinity where the man was the breadwinner, which, which incidentally is dependent on the woman being at home. You know, the two things can't exist um, independently of each other and if men try and change then women will, will welcome them back. <laughs> <laughs> Charlotte Raven, thank you very much indeed. Well, we've mapped out the case for a political project for men and Charlotte Raven has dismissed it uh, politely. Our four guests have been listening to the arguments and thinking about some answers, so let's start with uh, men and work, Oliver. Um,